What is up, guys? Welcome to DIY or Die and another episode of Vapor Alert. I'm your host, Wayne Walker. Today I want to talk about this article that come that came out of the vaping post called the FDA hearing that wasn't. We were talking about last week how the FDA was holding a public hearing that was talking about drug therapy options for to, to curtail youth nicotine usage and youth addiction. This was kind of a scary thing to see how quickly the FDA is able to kind of pivot to hooking our children on drugs. But while it's scary, it's not very surprising. This is kind of what they do. This is their MO. This is what their donors want. This is what their you know funders want. And this is just kind of how it goes. So the hearing was held and the Vaping Post writer, Michael McGrady, was able to put out uh, his opinions and his thoughts and his views on the hearing since he was there. It starts off by saying, public health advocates gathered at the Maryland campus of the FDA on January 18th to discuss implications of the so-called youth vaping epidemic. During a public hearing regarding potential regulatory action, representatives from some of the country's leading anti-tobacco organizations utilized an event that was intended for even-handed discussion as a platform to misinform the broader public on e-cigarettes further. So many other harm reduction activists and I were left speechless during the hearing. In no way was the opinion of the vaping industry nor the academic backers of vaporized harm reduction granted the respect needed to have a productive conversation during the hearing. And of course, this is kind of what these public hearings become. A lot of these anti-organizations, they get their donors to fund them money to go to these things. Sometimes they bring children and they basically try to pressure and lobby the FDA into further swaying them to back them. Instead, FDA's representatives, including Jennifer Rodriguez Pippins of Commissioner Scott Gottlieb's entourage, bought into the one-sided debate with open arms. We already know the FDA kind of has made up their mind on vaping. It's really up to the vaping industry to do everything in its power to show the FDA that this product is not only legit, but that it can make money, that it can satisfy the monetary needs of the FDA and the states involved, and also that it can satisfy the needs of the antis and kind of put out a good PR, good public image. Furthermore, one of the key takeaways from the hearing that became the most troubling was how marginalized harm reduction approaches were. As we've seen in the national debate surrounding vaping, public health regulators and activists want to force flavor and marketing bans on most vaping products, usually citing the apparent push by manufacturers like Juul to market to minors. The calls for a series of bans were abundant. So what this hearing became was really this one-sided harping against vaping products, talking, you know, bringing up the youth aspect again, saying how these products are, are, are targeting minors with their flavors, with their designs, with how they look, with how easy and convenient they are. And none of the conversation is ever focused around vaping compared to smoking. And that is where we win. We always win that conversation. So what the antis learned is that they, can, they have to constantly harp on youth initiation, marketing and flavors. For example, Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher of Stanford University School of Medicine urged FDA to ban all flavors and marketing for flavors. Not to mention, she also advocated for the agency to prevent e-cigarette companies from making claims that their products are safer than tradi traditional combustible tobacco cigarettes and offer potential therapeutic benefits. So I don't know if you know right now, but it is illegal for a company, a vaping company, to say that their products will help you quit smoking and are safer than cigarettes. That just obviously shows that Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher of Stanford University School of Medicine doesn't, doesn't know anything about the industry. She doesn't know anything about the products. She just sees flavors, she sees teens using them, and in her mind, her emotions get drummed up and now she wants to ban it. She wants to put it, put it to rest. With the antis, there's never a debate upon, which I think would be a healthy debate, upon exactly what goes into the products that are being made and being inhaled and exactly how how much safer these are compared to cigarettes. We know with the Public Health England study as well as the new NYU study that it's about 95% safer than traditional smoking. But we still don't have that definitive answer and I think not only would that really help us but that would also help drive the discussion away from youth initiation and back onto smoking and back onto saving adults' lives, adult smoker lives. But the most troubling of claims from the hearing came from anti-smoking activist Ruth McCormick of Long Island. McCormick dared to claim that fourth graders are going through several jewel pods a day and that the act of vaping 
Thus, consumption of nicotine caused the teen to jump in front of a train and commit a suicidal act. So you heard me correctly. Ruth McCormick went to this public hearing and claimed that fourth graders are going through several jewel pods a day. And because of the consumption of nicotine, just consuming nicotine, just using the jewel pod, no other external factors involved, caused a child to jump in front of a train and kill themselves. I don't, I don't understand how this woman could be taken seriously after making that assumption, make, making that claim. Chris Howard states, I am very disappointed in the outcome. Much of what was presented by the opposition are results of misinformed opinion and emulate the scare tactics of activists attempts to fight reefer madness, for example. Further down the article, it states, now the FDA is expected to announce the new layers of regulatory encroachment on the vaping industry in the coming weeks. In my conversations with Howard and other harm reduction activists, they expect Commissioner Gottlieb to levy even more invasive regulations than those initially considered. These measures are likely to include flavor bans, restrictive marketing regulations, and politically motivated initiatives to sensationalize further the long exaggerated claims against vaping. But the regulations are still on the horizon as clearly noted by the aftermath of the hearing. Additionally, Gottlieb posted to Twitter in Trumpian fashion this past Saturday that the vaping industry faces an existential threat if youth vaping isn't curtailed. I still believe e-cigs offer an opportunity for currently addicted adult smokers to transition off cigarettes and onto products that may not have the same level of risk. But if youth use continues to rise, the entire category faces an existential threat. I believe if every currently addicted adult smoker switched completely to e-cigarettes, it would provide a tremendous public health gain. But that opportunity is in significant risk if kids' use continues to rise. There's an opportunity now for responsible parties to address address use, youth use. Anytime someone was talking about child appealing labels, it was always met with somewhat of a disdain from a lot of the vaping industry, but the other side of the vaping industry didn't care and they kept pushing out crazier and crazier marketing. And unfortunately it comes back to bite you in the ass because we, because then we can't fight on that front. We can't say, look, my Captain Crunch e-liquid that has a cartoon Captain Crunch guy on it, you know, fighting a dragon uh, is not, targeting children. You can't say that. You can't say that when there are labels that look that way. We lose that fight. The only fight that we can win is the economic fight. We can win the smoking fight, comparing vaping to smoking, and we can win the fight on science. But when it comes to the emotional fight, when it comes to the fight against the youth initiation, when it comes to the fight of public image, when it comes to the fight of, you know, soccer moms, we lose that battle. We lose that battle. So it seemed like the hearing wasn't a good thing. It wasn't a success for the vaping industry. No one wanted to hear what the vaping industry had to offer. It looks as if there's a lot more collusion than we thought, just even talking about drug therapies uh, to, to curtail public health or to curtail youth initiation and youth nicotine addiction. And then Gottlieb tweeting out these threats. Uh, these Trumpian threats is just insane. You know, that's what we have in this administration. We have, we have just complete disregard for anyone, just completely disregard for anyone. It's only about these politicians. It's only about their donors and it sucks. It, it, it sucks, but we got to keep fighting, man. We got to keep fighting. We got to keep putting our, our pedal to the metal. We are making headway to hear Gottlieb even say, Hey, if, if everyone, if every adult smoker switched to vaping, then it would be a tremendous public health gain. That's really big. That's really big. But still, it's not enough. There's still no standards board for vaping. There's no just overall industry standards board. There's still no definitive science. There's really no one studying what's in these vapor products when they are heated, at the temperatures that they're heated, in the, comp in the compositions that they're made in. And there's still a long way to go. But uh, I'm going to keep you guys updated. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you slap a like on it and subscribe if you want to see more videos about vaping advocacy, DIY e-liquid e recipes, reviews, all that good stuff. And don't forget to head over to my website, DIYordiveVaping.com. Oh yeah, and my Instagram, at DIYordiveVaping. I'm going to catch you guys later. Keep mixing. Much love. Peace.